Okay. Can we start with a prayer? Yes, please. Lord, thank you for this church. We do so much here with so few resources. We're richer than most, but we so there's so much we want to do. Thank you for the joy of this, this Sunday school. Thank you for the joy of our salvation. Thank you for this good news that Paul preaches us in 2 Corinthians. Bless us now, Lord, as we consider resurrection and life after death. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, who is Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 Okay, folks, uh, any questions about last week? Anything? I heard it was great, and I had, couldn't be here. Oh, was, I wait, it's on. You can watch. I know, but I, I won't be the person. I should. I'll just watch it. Uh, uh, the um, uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna start. The next passage is about resurrection <clears throat> and life after death. Uh, it's complicated, uh, and it's uh, very, it has deep roots, so I'm expecting to take at least two classes on this, maybe more. Yay! Uh, and I'm going to start uh, by talking about just the, how this notion of resurrection evolved. So, any questions before we start? Okay. Uh, there, you know, the common, it's commonly said that, you know, that there's no real resurrection in the Old Testament. Well, there is and there isn't. Um, the, the prophets in particular weren't prepared to allow things to end abruptly. Just, they weren't prepared to allow things just to end that way. So here's a, a Isaiah 25, and Isaiah, there are lots of other passages, such as uh, the great one about the, um, um, the bones, um, um, the uh, revivifying the bones of Israel. But here's a different one. This is from Isaiah 25, verse 7 and following. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He shall swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of this people. He will take away from all earth what the Lord has spoken. We generally, however, look at um, uh, the the, the, the notion of resurrection as we meet it in the New Testament with the, uh, the Maccabees, just to refresh your memory a little bit, uh, in hundred and about 168, 167, something like that, Antiochus uh, Epiphanes, uh, Epiph Antiochus IV Epiphanes, he was the Greek king in Damascus. Syria. Um, the the uh, near east, the Far East and the Middle East were uh, not the Far East, but the Middle East was divided amongst uh, the generals of Alexander, and so the uh, the uh, anti in Antioch and Antiochus, this this was the general who had Syria, um, and he. That he became, he, he came, kind of outgrew his um, his, his, his status. Uh, Epiphanes is what he placed on his name, which, may, which means epiphany, basically. Um, mm -hmm. he, his name was Antiochus IV. Uh, Antioch is named after him. Several cities called him uh, after his family. Uh, but he added the, 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 the name and uh, 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 Epiphanes to it, which means the appearance of God, you know. 
uh, on the face of, upon the face of God, something like that. It's an epiphany, same one. Uh, and uh, he decided that he was going to expand. There was always this this fight between um, Egypt to the south and Syria to the north, and the fight is over Palestine, basically. And Egypt wants to go north, and, Pal and Syria wants to come south. And at this time, uh, Egypt was controlling Palestine, and Epiphanes, uh, Antiochus IV, wanted to uh, started going after Egypt, and he actually invaded Egypt, and uh, uh, he was pushed back, but nonetheless, it cost him a pile, uh, and he needed money, so he decided that he was going to raid the temple in Jerusalem, and he did. And he went in, took went into Jerusalem, into the temple in Jerusalem. He took all the the the, the, the assets out. There's a lot of cash and gold in the temples always. It's a, it serves as kind of a repository of gold and, and for banking and stuff like that. But also there are ornaments, etc. So he took it all and he desecrated the temple. He decided he was going to put one of his statues in the temple. And he decided that he was going to eradicate uh, Judaism because they were in great opposition to him. So uh, then he, so he, he, he <laughs> desecrated the temple and he started to, he passed laws or he decreed that, that the Jews couldn't anymore uh, do certain things. It couldn't make the sacrifices, couldn't uh, read the scriptures at home, et cetera, et cetera, and tried to obliterate Judaism. And this uh, this generated a response from uh, the uh, from the Hasmoneans, uh, uh, a family uh, in mid in a small town, and uh, one of what, what they had the brothers, the Maccabee brothers, Judas was the Judas Maccabeus. He had three brothers, I think. I think it was three. And they, they uh, under the leadership of their father, started a, uh, a civil revolt. It's an extraordinary civil revolt. It was guerrilla warfare. The Greek armies were really quite good. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what about what year? This is 165 or so BC. I'm sorry, sorry. 165 or so BC. Okay, before that. Thank you. Uh, and he's, um, uh, they, they, there was no standing army. Uh, in fact, uh, Jerusalem wasn't really independent. It was under the control of either the Egyptians or the, or the, uh, or the Syrians. They really had no independent. Uh, uh, existence as a nation. Um, and uh, the Maccabees did a guerrilla warfare. And it was extraordinary. They beat the heads off the Greeks. This is, uh, and, and they ran them out. And they uh, um, uh, cleansed the temple. Judas Maccabees, they went in and cleansed the temple. And the, and the uh, story is, is they went in there and they needed oil uh, and to do it and they didn't have enough oil but miraculously the oil to light the labs just replenished itself uh, and this come, becomes the festival of lights the menorah comes from this notion of the festival of life this is Hanukkah um, so um, but what he was what, what uh, Antiochus was doing was just killing people he was executing those who were not following his uh, anti-Judaism rules. So here we are, that people who were faithful were dying. Mm -hmm. That's not supposed to be. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, in this era, right here in the 165, 164, 166 era, 164 is the, is the date we were nearly give to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel is not a classic prophet, though we place him in the prophets. He's actually part of the writings. And here we have 
uh, a, a vision uh, of, of the future uh, that uh, looks to the arrival of a Messiah. Uh, and this Messiah is going to come from the clouds. And uh, he's, uh, we, we see the, the, the uh, Daniel and the Diet lines, and we see the, 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 the statues, uh, the history uh, of nations. Uh, and uh, we can read all that and about what's happening. And eventually it gets down to cleansing the temple. The, we can tell uh, when it was written, when, uh, if you read everything in it metaphorically, you can place where uh, Daniel stops telling what has happened and starts telling what will happen because he doesn't get it all right. <laughs> that's why we can place this at about 164. Um, and it is in here, as part of his vision in the future, we read this. This is from the last chapter of Daniel, uh, chapter 12. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of the people, shall arise. There shall be anguish such as never occurred since nation first came into existence. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep with the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Now, this is, is the key notion of, um, uh, of, of resurrection. Now, it is, uh, resurrection is mentioned in uh, the books of Maccabees, uh, which are later, uh, but it is uh, this notion that, every, that God's going to come and everybody's going to rise. That's we call that a general resurrection. Okay, that is to say that upon the arrival of the Messiah, everybody rises. Some to damnation, according to, to Daniel, and some to some kind of glory. All right, and we see this. Uh, and now this is 150, 60 years before Jesus. This this has developed in the time of the Pharisees as well. Uh, you will recall that uh, the the, uh, the Sadducees did not believe in an afterlife, but the Pharisees did. Uh, and we get a we get a little uh, taste of this in John 11 with Mary and Martha. And, uh, and Lazarus, and Jesus went to there, and Lazarus was was uh, was already dead, and they, Mary and Martha, they really uh, were distressed about this, uh, and then because he didn't come in time to to heal him, and Jesus said to her, "Your brother will rise again," and Martha said to him, "I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day," and Jesus said to her. I am the resurrection and the life and those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Mm -hmm. Now, that's um, uh, uh, what we, we hear Martha saying is she's expecting this general resurrection um, say, well, for, on the last day. Who died? First you have to be. For, for, for everybody. Who, well, who for, at least for Lazarus and for those folks. It's unclear about people who are not Jews and people who are not righteous, say. But people who have died. People oh, who have died. Okay. Right? Uh, and John 5 says something really interesting. I'm going to find it here. Um, the, um, uh, I should have I just remembered this as we're speaking about it now. And it's one of the things that uh, puzzled me early on. Um, and I can't get to five. Here it is. You're looking for five. What verse? Pardon me? What verse? Uh, give me a second. I'll find it here. Twenty-five. 
the prior of 25. This is Jesus speaking. Verily, verily, I tell you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear him will live. Um, so uh, this is um, uh, uh, let me finish go on and read that. And, and, and uh, those for just as the Father himself has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be astonished at this. The hour is coming when all who hear my who, who all um, the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and will come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Okay, so this is we're talking about uh, uh, this is different from uh, uh, from uh, a new life in Christ. These are people who are in the graves mm -hmm. and are raised here. Okay. To, meet, to meet God. Uh, to, to call out that, to meet God. And here we have this notion of uh, kind of a heaven and a hell kind of thing. Mm -hmm. God for, to, to, for some kind of glory and then damnation as well. So we have that general resurrection. Okay. Um, and it's keyed to the arrival of the Messiah. Now, uh, what happens in, uh, is that becomes keyed to the return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wait, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get this in my head. It, when you say the return of Jesus, do you mean after he was dead, buried, and resurrected? Yeah. Or are we looking at the future time when Jesus returns? Like now or whenever in the future Jesus may return? Yeah. The, the idea that uh, people would go die and go directly to heaven is not really in the New Testament, folks. It's right. not there. And that's where we're going to talk about that when we get to the lesson, right? Uh, that's uh, uh, that, that. Well, we'll get into that a little bit further. Well, did Jesus rise after he immediately after he was crucified? He was. Did he ascend even later? Yeah, yeah, he ascended later. But I understand this: that the notion of an individual being uh, resurrected, right? Existing. It's not in the cards. It's just not part of the understanding of resurrection. Resurrection is a uh, is, is a mass event upon the arrival of the Messiah. Oh, see, from the Old Testament. Well, from the Old Testament. Okay, okay. But that carries over. Okay. I'll show you. Okay. Um, okay. So um, that's interesting. So that uh, this we're still dealing with this problem of what happens. Between the time we die and uh, the resurrection, the, the return of Christ, and that's the topic of today's oh, lesson. Oh, goody! Oh, so, good. Yes, we were. That's that's what that's what's there. But let me let me go through this a little bit. Okay. Um, so the individual resurrection was not considered, um, and, and the understanding we we kind of think that the when we die, our soul goes immediately to heaven. Right. The soul was not really seen in that way mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in Paul's time. The, the, the Jews could not contemplate, just could not grok uh, the notion of a, um, a distinction between soul and body. Um, a person was a soul, okay? Um, let me show you how it works. I'm going to read here from Genesis 2 7. You can look, turn to it if you wish, but I'll read it. Uh, and this is the creation of Adam and Eve, right? At least Adam. This is what it reads And then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Okay, that's how 
Uh, and incidentally, uh, in terms of life, what defines life from that point forward in the Old Testament and the New, life is defined by breathing. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the biblical norm is that when breath stops, life stops. Now, our technology has made that very, very complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, that's the biblical norm. Okay, let me read this thing to you. Um, and and uh, first of all, I'm going to read it in Hebrew and then translate it uh, kind of word for word. Yeyeth, uh, Yehovah, uh, Elohim, et Adama. Afar min adama yifa the 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 afri nishmat yam wa yehi adam adam len lenefesh. Okay, let me read it. Uh, and it said it goes this way: informed. God Yahweh, God Yahweh formed the man from the dust, uh, from the dust of the earth, and breathed um, in the nostrils the breath of life and became the man a living being. Now, here's the, here's the trick to it. It's, it's not um, easily seen. When it says, uh, first of all, uh, God created the man from the dust of the earth. The earth here is uh, Adama. Okay. Ha Adama. Uh, and the word <coughs> breathe, the verb breathe, is nephesh. Okay. So he, he took from Adama and nephished uh, into his nostrils uh, the breath of life and became a Adam, a man, uh, a living nephesh. Oh, a living breath. Yes. Okay, do it one more time for us. Say it okay. one more time. So he, he God uh, took uh, the man from the dust uh, of okay. the earth. No, I mean the Hebrew. So finish. Okay. Uh, Adam and breathed and nephished into the nostrils uh, the breath of life and uh, Adam, the man, became a living nephesh. <laughs> See, and so in this particular notion, it's just, I mean, the nephesh is frequently translated soul or life. Um, and, and you can't, you can't divorce this, this inner existence, this, this life force. From the sarks, the, from the flesh, can't be done. So, um, what happened when when we started talking about? Well, let me move on here. So, we the the Paul and in the New Testament, uh, they talked about the resurrection of the body because they could not even conceive of a soulless body because. The soul was the man. See, a man was a living soul, a living nephesh. Okay. Now, uh, let's also talk about a little bit about uh, the dis this notion of body. One of the clear um, um, distinctions in the term in the term body is is the distinction between sarx and soma. Sarx is flesh, period. Uh, it means body, but its connotation is that it's it's fleshly, it's it's got appetites, it it decays, it you know, it decays, it uh, it is the, the, the it encases whatever else there is part of us here. Um, so, and we're talking about Greek words here now. These are not Hebrew words. The Greek word starts to, to, to divide this up here. 
So Paul uses the term sarks to be a flesh. Um, and it is never used. Oh, and then they have the other word soma, which can mean body, but doesn't mean flesh. Oh, interesting. It doesn't. I mean, it's clear distinction between soma and sarks here. Mm -hmm. So I just can I just quick ask? So in, sure. this is my body given for you. And it's a soma, not flesh. See, it's the soma, and the resurrection soma is what we're talking about here. It is a distinction. It is not. Not. I mean, it, yes, just it got clothes. We'll see. The soma has clothes here. Uh, this resurrection soma body is different from the flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, so, um, well, we, uh, we were talking about the soma, the soma from the flesh and blood. Does that mean the soma encases the soul? The soma in the, it, 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 it is, yeah. The, the soul is more related to the soma. The soul is not related to the such. The, the term but soul soma is not, They are not equivalent. Soma and soul are no. not equivalent. Yeah, no. right. Okay. And it's body. Mm -hmm. uh, the soul is suke. Uh, and it is, uh, let me turn this thing off here. Mm -hmm. Whatever that is. Uh, the, the soma and the soul. So here's what. Um, uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 15, 44, it is sown a physical body, it has raised a spiritual body. Uh, but if if there is a physical body, there's also a spiritual body. So we're talking about uh, physical, I think he may have used soma here, the physical soma, mm -hmm. as opposed to a spiritual soma. So uh, when we're talking about the resurrection of the body, we're not talking about zombies walking around. Uh, we're, we're talking about a, a different quality of existence. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, so that's that, that's the term uh, that, for, for, that that's what we're talking about when we're talking about resurrection. I think I need to talk about Paul a lot. Um, Paul is the first interpreter of, of the events, right? Uh, everything else is written after Paul, right? Um, and and uh, here was what we know about, uh, this is what I believe about Paul. This is how I put it together. I think others might put it together differently. He claimed apostleship, but he wasn't an apostle. Not in the sense that he was engaged in, in Jesus before his life, uh, witnessed the resurrection, or witnessed the crucifixion and the resurrection. He was not a part of those apostles, but he claimed it because he said, uh, claimed that the, the Jesus he met on the road to Damascus was the resurrected Christ. And so therefore, he saw the body of Christ, the, the, the living Christ. Mm -hmm. Jesus did not die and remain dead. Jesus died and was resurrected and remains alive. Mm -hmm. so that's the theology here. Mm -hmm. um, but, he, and he, but he claimed apostleship. Um, and he, but he had a different, different status. Consider the apostles. They have fishermen, we got tax collectors, we got all these folks. These folks were, were men of the earth, men of uh, uh, who did weren't acquainted with the philosophies of Socrates and, uh, and the, the larger world. They may not have been able to read. Uh, we the, these are very very. I'm going to use the term common men here, not in a pejorative sense, but in just ordinary people mm -hmm. that were selected uh, for probably for their faithfulness in their ordinary life. And I mean, Jesus selected his apostles. So it seems like he, he wanted certain people as his core. 
But Paul was different. He was an intellectual, no clear, I mean, there's no question about this. He had an education, uh, a very advanced education, in fact. Um, he called himself uh, a Hebrew of Hebrews kind of thing. He, he was a Pharisee, um, which means that he had a religious education. He, he, he spoke Greek and, uh, and Hebrew. And he was familiar with not only the, the, the culture of Israel and Palestine, but he was also uh, familiar with Greek and Roman culture. As you know, if the apostles would love today, they would be country and Western fans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they were country folk. Uh, Paul was urban and cosmopolitan, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he, 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 uh, Tarsus was at a crossroads uh, of Roman roads that, that leaked uh, one way to, when you go into the east to Antioch and to the Egypt and, and place into Damascus and places east. And if you go west, you go into uh, the Anatolian Peninsula and to the Roman and to the Greek culture. And that's where he was. And there were a lot of mixing there in Tarsus. Um, his, he was, and also he had a different situation. Um, the, we, when we read about the, the, the early church in the first part of Acts, we can see them struggling to, to, to define themselves and to organize themselves into this into this group here, this church, right? Well, Paul had a different situation. Uh, he was speaking to a Gentile world. That's a different world to speak to. He was Hellenistic rather than it was a Hellenistic rather than Jewish culture. That's the, 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 the Hellenistic world was, was guided by the philosophers or Aristotle and uh, Plato and all these folks, the, the uh, uh, Epicureans and Stoics and all these different philosophical schools. And, and Paul was familiar with them. And in fact, he shows a lot of Stoicism of the Stoic philosophies in, in his in his writing. And also with many gods. And many gods. All of those guys. Yeah. And, and of course, a completely different political culture, social culture. Uh, his audience were Greek speakers, and he wrote in Greek, very fine Greek. Uh, he had a calling to spread the gospel beyond Palestine. Mm -hmm. right. That was his. That was his calling from the very beginning. So he had a, a different, different situation to face. And finally, uh, uh, he was um, uh, organizationally minded mm -hmm. in a way that certainly uh, the, the apostles were not. We know they had an organization so that Peter was apparently in charge and there was a treasurer who was Judas. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always work out right. But and nonetheless, Paul, and uh, Paul was a, a Pharisee, a he believed in the resurrection. Right? Say that again, please. But Paul was also a Pharisee. Right, so he, he was a Pharisee. Up, he was, yeah. he he was, was brought up believing in this general resurrection. But here, all of a sudden, he saw someone that broke the rules, and this was Jesus. We got a single resurrection. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. so, and and um, so uh, this notion of resurrection was critical to him because that's all he knew about Jesus. Great. Right. Right. See, you understand that what well, read it, go ahead, consider this in the writings of Paul, there's almost nothing about Jesus' life. Right. It's all about resurrection. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, 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 uh, uh, um, it's 
Mm -hmm. It's critical to him. It's absolutely critical. Um, the whole gospel of Jesus Christ rested on this notion of resurrection. Now, one of the differences between Paul and the other apostles is that um, the, the apostles, you can see them in some of their writings, John, Peter, James, uh, they, they had uh, a, a more mundane concern about issues and purity and, and rules and organization, stuff like that. Uh, Paul, on the other hand, was thought in organizational terms. Uh, and he, he wanted to establish and maintain churches all over the known world. Okay. And, and and he was uh, he, he he he's going and founding churches and set up a, a system where he could communicate with them. He would make multiple visits to them. He would uh, he knew the people in the churches, and significantly, he wanted to include the Jerusalem church in it. He kept going back to Jerusalem, and he wanted to raise money for them. So Paul's vision uh, was different from the get-go. When he went back to the church in Jerusalem, it was not the temple; it was someplace else. Right? He went to the he, that's right. He went to the church in, the, in, in, in uh, Acts fifteen. That's the Jerusalem Council, uh, and we don't know. Well, no, he probably didn't go to the temple. The right. he well, okay. yes, he did. He later went to the temple and, and cleansed himself as a Jew. But when he met with the church, he didn't meet in the temple. He met someplace else. Yeah. Okay. Already it was. It was already the, the, in Acts 15. What we see is a, a congruent body that was led by James. There was a speaker, apparently a leader of this group, uh, and they had a system of deciding. So, uh, so they. Um, um, James, the brother. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine so, that? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we had a different, different, Paul insisted on doing that. He, he raised money. We'll see about the money a little bit here. And he took it back to Jerusalem and he gave it to the church. And then he went to the temple to, um, uh, to do his Jewish duties. Jewish Christian duties. Understand at this time, the, the church did not distinguish itself from the from the Judaism, except for the recognition of the Messiah. It wasn't until later that the, Jew, the church fully broke off. I think scripture, scriptural uh, uh, scheme is that it happened at the end of Acts. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's, that's my interpretation. Uh, we know from external evidence that Judaism and Christianity remained kind of uh, intermingled for quite some time, uh, and it was more gradual than Acts wants us to tell. We still are. Yeah. Now, I'm going to read here um, the, the most of the 15th chapter of First Corinthians. Um, let me read it here because um, this is how it works out. Now, um, so let me get it here. The 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians? First, yeah. First Corinthians 15. I'm going to read this because this is the most complete and thorough statement uh, about uh, uh, resurrection. Now, understand, one of the things that's different between Paul and the rest of the apostles was they were describing what they saw. They were witnesses to this resurrection, right? Paul took it one step further. He said, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. See, and once you get into what it means, you're talking about development of doctrine and ideas that are uh, not, that, that spring forth from the fact that this man, Jesus, was resurrected and met Paul on the road. Uh, and that, I believe, personally, that the there's a thing called Pauline Christianity uh, that really has 
is 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 a label put on it in, uh, in the 20th century, early 20th century. And that is the notion that the Christianity we have today is substantially comes from Paul. But there are other kinds of uh, Christianity. The Christianity reflected in the Gospel of John, for instance, and the Christianity that's reflected in, in, in Luke Acts and Christianity reflected in uh, the apocalypse and the other epistles. There's, there are variations. There are denominations, so to speak, of Christianity. Uh, and Paul recognizes in the beginning of Acts, you know, some are saying, I'm from Cephas, and I'm from Paul, and I'm from this person, and I'm from that person. It's already starting to break up. Yeah, but Paul, Paul, Pauline Christianity is its own ilk, and it is so powerful that it has been uh, um, formative, particularly for Protestant Christianity. Oh, uh, because we read the gospel so much. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, because we read the Bible in its in its uh, yeah. in its we, itself. The church quickly um, took um, the message, the Christian gospel, and incorporated into a a, a system of authorities and a system of liturgies, litanies, that is probably better reflected in the Eastern, Eastern Orthodox Church. And that's a different flavor of Christianity entirely. Uh, and then the Western Church picked it up with Rome, who uh, eventually uh, got, Martin Luther eventually split off from Rome, but that was 1,500 years later. Yeah, so, yeah. 1,200 years later. So um, we have a uh, uh, this Pauline Christianity, particularly for Protestants, is the dominant form mm -hmm. of Christianity. And so he, and it's partly is because he interpreted, he took the steps to interpret what these things mean. And this is his most complete interpretation of the uh, meaning uh, of what happened and what it means. So 1 Corinthians 15. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which you also are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I have that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. <laughs> For I handed to you uh, as of first importance what I in turn had received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12 and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. And then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace towards me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I have worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then, uh, whether then was I, or what, whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so we have come to believe. Now, this is the witness to the resurrection, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's what the first part of Acts, that's what, the, that's what made the church form in the first place. And that's what the first part of Acts is all about, mm -hmm. about the formation of these witnesses who then spoke, to, uh, I mean, the word is that it quickly became 5,000, 5,000 people didn't witness the resurrection, 12 did, or 11, and uh, the, uh, but 11 plus, uh, so they, uh, uh, they quickly started spreading it around to this distinctly Jewish culture in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now, let me read the rest here. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Apparently, some are claiming it. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, um, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. 
we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not, has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your, few, your faith is futile and you are all in your sins. Then also those who have died in Christ have perished. If for is this life only, we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If for this reason only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruit, now here he's starting to interpret. The first uh, fruits of those who have died is the first fruits, right? For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For all of us die in Adam as, as Adam. Adam, uh, all of us die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom of God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. For the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that this does not include the one who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subject, subjected to the one who put all things and subjected under him, so that God may be all in all. Okay, we're talking about an interpretation of the end times here. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he's, 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 he's saying this is significant, not only uh, for, 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 salvation, for salvation for being raised, but it's also significant significant for the cosmos, for creating itself. Uh, and so he's saying uh, that this is a, uh, that Jesus was is part of the creation, uh, but also the end time. This notion that John has of in the beginning was God, and God was, uh, he, uh, and he was, Jesus was part of creation. That's also reflected in Philippians. So, so and that's not, that didn't you know, originate with John. He just put it down in an extraordinarily poetic form. But this notion that Jesus was uh, a part of creation and now a part of uh, the sustenance of the universe and resurrection and the uh, essential part of the coming, uh, second coming of Christ, after which, uh, after which the, he will subdue all the powers of the earth and then finally subdue himself to God so that God can be all in all. See, so now that's, that, pardon me? He sort of separates the sun from God. Well, in that, in yeah, bit. but we don't. Yeah. For our purposes, it's yeah. not separation. Yeah. This is, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is an extraordinary extrapolation from his meeting with Jesus on the road. Yeah. Yeah, I think he started thinking and went off to, 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 to Arabia for wherever he went for a while. He started thinking. And he started thinking, let me go continue on. Um, otherwise, this is verse 29. Otherwise, what will those people who do who receive baptism on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Now, this is a belief that the church is kind of eradicated. Yeah. Uh, but they did, and particularly in the Protestant Church. You you can buy uh, you can buy dispensations for the dead in the time of Martin Luther. So oh, let's see. And the Church of originated this notion of limbo and where where and and uh, purgatory, purgatory, uh, purgatory in particular. But uh, so you can be retrieved, you can be dead, retrieved from purgatory. And that's how it's continued on. The Protestant church just kind of ignores this. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown. Wait, where are you? Where are you? I meant uh, verse 40, 
Oops. Yeah, but it was we, 42. But you, you skipped a whole bunch. Oh, did I? Yeah, um, we were at 29. 29. So you're at 30, uh, I think. Okay. okay. Well, I'm right. sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and why are we putting ourselves in danger every hour? I die every day. That That is... That is as certain brothers and sisters as my boasting of you, a boast that I make in Christ Jesus our Lord. If with merely human hopes I fought with wild animals at Ephesus, what would I have gained by it? If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, and uh, eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Come to a sober and right mind and sin no more, for some people have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. To their shame. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, the, the, so uh, but if someone were to ask, so you, you can see this is an extrapolation once again uh, of what this resurrection thing means. If someone were to ask, how then are the dead raised? What kind of body do they, uh, uh, with what kind of body do they come? Well, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And if it is for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some grain. But God gives it a body he has chosen, and to each kind of seed, its own body. Not all flesh is alike. But there is one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one thing, and that of the earthly is another. There is one glory of one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and indeed the stars are different glory. So, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there, uh, if there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spirit that is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. And as was the man of dust, so are those who are of dust. And as is the man of heaven, so, the, uh, so are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of, man of the man of dust, we also bear the image of the man of heaven. Mm. Okay, we're talking about this body not being a resurrection body. We're talking about soma. Right. It's a different and, thing. And, and is he talking about all of us in this, that we are this? Well, he's talking. Or is he talking about just Jesus? I'm very he's confused. talking about all of us. So this man and that man, this man and that man, that's all of us. Well, that's people. That man was Jesus. Uh, uh, we, got, we, got, we got different men here. Yeah. We got Jesus, Adam, yeah. who was the first... The Healing. second Adam is Jesus. Okay, that's what I mean. Okay, thank you. And, and, the and, second man yeah, is yeah. Jesus. Okay. Okay, okay. And verse 50. We'll get to the end here. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit, inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die. We will all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the devil will be raised and perishable and we will be and we will uh, and we, we will be changed for this perishable body must put on imperishability and this mortal body must put on immortality and then this perishable body puts on imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality and then the saying that is written will be fulfilled death has been swallowed up in victory Oh, death, where is your victory? Where, oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. That's, that's, good. The, that's, that's really good. That's the punchline. Yeah. Death, mm -hmm. where is the victory? Now, one of the, one of the, we have to explain how it is that this Christianity grew from 
both people uh, to uh, perhaps a quarter or a third of the Roman Empire by the time of Constantine. That's an extraordinary growth. Mm -hmm. It can be accounted for, incidentally, uh, if you uh, statistically can be accounted for. Uh, and just in terms of an ordinary book, it doesn't have to be uh, miraculous. Uh, just like, for instance, the growth of the, uh, the Latter-day Saints Church can be statistically accounted for by virtue of how they how they send out their apostles and bring people in. So, but nonetheless, uh, what what was attractive? Well, there were lots of things attractive to to about Christianity. Uh, and most of them are also attractive to in Judaism, so that we have a whole bunch of God fears out there who would in fact go to the synagogues and participate in worship and listen to the Jewish Jews talk about God, this singular God who accounted for everything, this singular God who was a God of, uh, of morality and justice and uh, who stood for a certain kind of way of life and who could be. Uh, and if things were, if somebody did something wrong, people were accountable, mm -hmm. and there was justice in this. And so that was already there. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that was different, really substantially different, uh, it, there are two things. One is this notion of resurrection. This going around and preaching to these people were quite certain that when they die, they might there might be a soul inside them that floats up to heaven, possibly, but that's uh, uh, not not the kind of existence that we see in this resurrection. Well, we as a soma continue to exist. Um, the um, that that was a real attraction. Oh, that was an attraction that wasn't had any place else. Oh. Imperishable eternal life. That, that wasn't any place else. And also this Holy Spirit notion. That wasn't a part of Judaism, except that the, the ecstasy that came from it was not unique. Uh, there, we, there were ecstasies in the ancient cultures as well. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because um, the the attraction of eternal life, um, it loses value without the idea of forgiveness, though, right? Uh, what? So for eternal life is not necessarily an attractive concept without forgiveness. Oh, yes. Right? So, I mean, the two together is what That's makes right. it really... Yeah, important. absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and so there is what we develop throughout the rest of the Old Testament, and Paul mentions it here, uh, is that there is a judgment, good and bad. Now, that itself raises all kinds of problems uh, in terms of interpretation, but we're not going to go there. Okay. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this is a, uh, a, a, a resurrection uh, to, um, uh, to an eternity of glory. He uses that term glory. Uh, that is different from the resurrection of those who have been bad. <laughs> now, uh, there's, there, that's there, what Paul is saying. Yes, he does. He says it here in, in First Corinthians 15, uh, but he doesn't dwell on that. Okay. We get into that part into into other passages, particularly in Revelation. Oh yeah. Say. Uh, and that so this notion of heaven and hell has been incorporated in, into the warp and woof, and it, it may be a necessary thing because you can't have light without darkness. See, so it may be just conceptually not possible. Uh, you, know, you could do it conceptually by having universalism, which everybody gets saved, but that's not the kind of uh, mentality these folks had. There's justice and there ought to be justice. So okay, next week we're gonna we're gonna address a different part of this. Paul says up here that um, uh, that this is all going to happen when Jesus comes 
um, with, with here and we were we will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, where the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. What happens between the day time you die and the time of the return? That's key. <laughs> As the return or as the change in us. That is the return. That is the return. Our change is the return. We're talking about what we don't get to change until he comes back. That's right. Okay. Right. That's that's what Paul says. And he's gonna he, yes. he's gonna he's gonna he's gonna say that from the beginning. From the early things, we'll talk about that part next week. And uh, that's what we'll your start... Jehovah Witnesses tell you when, yeah. if you talk sure. to them. And, and they you know what to... happens? They can read First, first Thessalonians, I, yeah, and Second Thessalonians. This sure. is where Jesus people from. You were calling. Well, I'll get to it next week more fully. But people were concerned because people were dying before Jesus came. Oh yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah, and, and that's the problem. That raises a problem because of this notion of the general resurrection. Yeah. See, it doesn't happen until the Messiah comes. In this case, in our case, it's until the Messiah comes again. A parousia. It's like the ultimate to be continued. To be continued. <laughs> okay, folks. Thank you.